So, Beth, we're doing a whole series on the humans behind NFTs. Full disclosure, your NFT project is called Glitchy Bitches. Fascinating name. I want to dig into that. And I am a collector, so I own one of the NFTs. Um, but I want to start with you before we get into that. You have started your career. You studied architecture, right? But then you ended up going into product design and a, a emotional design in particular. What, what was the shift? Explain it. Yeah, so I started in architecture and then I went really? to make products that weren't buildings that took so long. <laughs> so I actually ended up um, in fashion design for a while. I worked for Gucci and their parent company, Caring. Um, and I also did a PhD in psychology. What'd you learn as part of that process? I learned a lot from fashion and particularly from a company like Gucci. Like they really understand desirability in a way that I think a lot of product designers and technology designers don't really think about and maybe sometimes even minimize. Fashion is just identity expression. And so the things that you're putting on your body or putting in your environment, they're also reflecting back to you what you care about. They're like, we're collecting things all of the time that say something about our values and are also reflecting those values back to ourselves. And so it's part of why I find this movement kind of interesting. Like I think NFTs are just a new way to do that. And when did you start hearing about NFTs as someone who spent their career in design and in product and fashion and all these different spaces? Um, what was the moment for you that you were like, okay, this is going to be something pretty big? I was teaching at Harvard at the time. I had some students in around 2013 become really into blockchain. And I'll be honest, I didn't really understand what the applications would be <laughs> at that time. And then it was in January 2021 when hash masks came out. It was the first NFT that I bought was a hash mask. And I just found it really interesting what they had done. And so the premise of hash mask is that an owner of the hash mask actually collaborates with the artist by being able to change the title of, of the piece. So it was just a textual change, but I really wanted it to be a visual change. I loved what they did. It's the first time I started to see that something more interesting could happen with this technology. You know, I think the one thing I've learned in my short time looking at NFTs and, um, and trying to understand the hype around a lot of this stuff is it's really, NFTs are a gateway into storytelling and emotion and representing something larger and IP and all of these things. Um, so I'm curious for you, because you've just launched a collection recently, what was it to you that it represented? Yeah, I mean, they're also very much about community. So they're not really, I mean, the JPEG almost doesn't matter that much, as much as <laughs> I'm an artist and I want to think that people will really enjoy the art that, that, that I created in the project. It's really like a ticket to a community. And in the case of what we built, an educational journey. So take me to 2020. How are you feeling and and what was happening in 2020 that helped lead you to, to do this collection? Everybody was struggling in 2020. Our family just really got kind of like a pile on of, um, we were facing death in the family and my husband and I started this tradition we called con coffee and contemplation where we would just go outside for 10 minutes or or the duration of a warm cup of coffee and just appreciate that moment as a way to have a break from <laughs> the chaos um and it was interesting because I think I I've always been a pretty busy person I've always been someone who maybe took mental health for granted and that coffee and contemplation kicked off this journey of learning more and more about um, ab about myself and about mental health tools that can help you deal with that kind of immediate stress. But also, um, it helped me like peel back some layers of some things that I hadn't dealt with 
What'd you find? This is part of what we're trying to do with this project and why I think community is so important is creating a space where that acknowledges that we'll all go through tremendous ups and downs in a lifetime right? and getting the support that we need quickly rather than waiting for a really long time. But in my case, I've had some experiences of violence, particularly sexual violence before. Um, and I just, you know, I didn't really know how to deal with that at the time and just kind of um, shoved it under the rug, like I think a lot of people do. And in, I think this is pretty common as you start to make space to see your mind and and deal with what your what whatever your present situation is you also begin to see other things so you're having these coffee and contemplation talks you're beginning to understand these things um, and you're beginning to see parts of yourself and and want to take these risks um, take me from that those moments while you're facing all these to when you decided to channel that into this art collection and what what work did you do along the way to get there so I think at the highest level, um, the glitchy bitches are a commentary on the paradox of, um, of people, and in this case, women, how we, we're constantly asking them to change. And meanwhile, they're trying to forge a sense of their own identity and maintain that identity over time. And so that's why these portraits change over time. And that's why they also um, are encoded with personality, it's called BQ, which is a bitchiness mm -hmm. quotient. And then my background, of course, I'm an artist and educator. I spent some time in fashion um, and I did my PhD in psychology. So I've kind of like combined all of these interests and there are three things that I'm trying to do with the project. So I want to highlight the importance of um, creative discovery as a way to reflect the self and um, and deal with like the ups and downs of life. I see this whole collection as kind of the seeds of a long-term mental health community. So I think often when these difficult moments happen in our lives, um, it's not intentional, but the people around us and, and the institutions we're part of sort of fail to respond with what can help us heal, right? Instead, it's a conversation about blame and whatnot, which is kind of the opposite. So it tends to isolate and silence when uh, it would be better to just normalize that things happen and provide a really supportive community that could hear the person and um, help them rebuild their trust in their community and help them regain a sense of hope. Um, and so, yeah, I, like, I think the opportunity, the community opportunity that this technology holds is the most interesting part. And I don't know of another long-term mental health community that is anything like this. If I could break it down a little bit, I mean, it sounds like you coded and, and created the project that you wish you'd had. And I spent a lot, I sp many, many years trying to, um, trying to kind of, I guess, be heard about these things that had happened um, and not really finding that. And I don't blame anybody. I, I think we aren't very, um, I certainly never received the kind of training to be there for people in a moment like that, that, um, that I think we all need. The actual art collection, it's 10,101 painted female portraits. Um, and what I thought was interesting is that this is the first NFT collection that changes on request with this idea that they are unpredictable they have different moods, not all of them good, right? Um, they're coded to be complex. So there's this concept um, that psychologists talk about called the fundamental attribution error. And we tend to more or less like flatten the complexity of other people. <laughs> 
and resist flattening of our own complexity. And that takes a number of forms, but one of the most common ones in the, in the at least in mental health is in um, victim blaming. So when something bad happens to someone, we tend to attribute it to uh, their personality or their way of being in the world. But when something bad happens to us, we expect people to appreciate the full nuance of the, of the situation and give us the benefit of the doubt. So I like this project is like kind of playing with that. It won't give, it won't allow you to simplify <laughs> Um, these GBs in a way that maybe we're used to. There is a barrier to entry, right, for your first time and how it works and it isn't 100% user friendly. And when we talk about NFT, GM, this and that, it's another language to so many folks. And in many ways, this is an element of this, a big element of this is the future. So not everyone has a Beth, right, to help them or is connected to tech folks to help them make their first NFT purchase to understand what they should and shouldn't do. What advice would you give people who are just trying to dip their toes in uh, into this whole world? This space is really young and there are some projects that um, are still pretty speculative or even a little bit scammy. So I think it's really important to check out the community first. And usually those communities are on Twitter and Discord and see if like, it, is it lively? Does it represent the kind of community that you wanna be a part of? Because that is the main value of, of this type of product. And then once, I mean, honestly, people are very friendly. So if you find the community that you wanna be a part of, just asking in the Discord or on Twitter, people will probably help you out. I got my start 2009, 2010, covering startups before they, they got big. And I set across from a lot of folks who promised to build out a better world. And um, things have gotten very complicated, as we both know. Right now, I can't help but think we do have an incredible opportunity with what Web3 uh, represents, which is you know this promise of ownership and decentralization and a more open environment. But I, I always go back to this idea of, will we actually build out a better world if it's not more inclusive? And I know this from my own experience, trying to get into some of this stuff, there's a barrier to entry. So I worry that a lot of these worlds will still be built by and for access-driven insiders. So, you know, as someone who's been in the space, who's seen it, how do we fix it? It's a big question. It's a huge question and it's a really important one. I don't think that's the track that it's currently headed on. So I think more people need to be um, need to be asking this question and trying to figure out steps to increase inclus inclusivity. But I think you and I both in our different careers have seen multiple cycles of like a next big wave in technology. And uh, it's so important that you have diversity at the beginning because those people are making really fundamental decisions about how that technology will evolve over time. And it's hard to find good statistics on this. I can't claim, but I have them, but I've heard uh, both that only 5% of NFT collectors are female. And I've also heard 16%. Either way, it's not very <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Um, and that may seem like it doesn't matter initially, but if you understand what these things are meant to be headed toward, they're basically governance tokens. They're tokens that give you a vote in how a community evolves over time. And the people who strongly believe in the evolution of Web3 believe that um, Companies like, say, a Facebook, which is a Web2 company, is owned by, um, by a company, obviously, <laughs> would be more so owned by the users of that company yeah. in Web3, right? And so it's more of like a co-op model, but with a, a new term, <laughs> a new term and a new technology. And so if, if that's the case, it becomes even more important that you have diversity from the beginning because that is who is making the decisions for how this evolves and who it caters to 
And so you can see in our project, it's a very, it's a project that is very much about women. It's, I think a lot of men go through some of these issues too, or feel the pressure to be changed by others while maintaining a strong sense of self. But we're, the art, everything about this project leans toward women, right? And, uh, and that's on purpose because we're hoping to attract more women to this space. And it's not that easy. So because there aren't that many people involved, because the onboarding is so difficult, um, it's just, it's, it's a problem that needs more attention. The whole series is about the humans behind the NFT. So it sounds like what you're saying is this, this project is, is you, is, a, is an NFT manifestation of everything you represent, right? This project is me, not only in kind of the history of what I have found useful to learn from, but it was really forged in the hardest year of my life, you know? I used this project to kind of work my way out <laughs> of, of unbelievable amounts of stress. And, uh, and I, I hope that it makes a space for people that I wish I had had, you know, and I hope that it starts um, or rather continues conversations about how, you know, we don't need to flatten one another's complexity, which I think does tend to happen in life, but also in technology. Like social media has already kind of flattened us to some idealized version of ourselves. And as we move into something like the metaverse, presumably that will continue. And I just like the idea of creating a digital first space that might enable even more, more of our complexity than real life interactions.